Over the years, our definition of a big city has changed, now reserved only for places with skyscrapers and mass transit. But 100 years ago, that wasn't the case. And if a town had places to eat, shop, board the horses, and see a movie, well, it was big. And by that standard, today's town was huge. Core Sick Anna. All together now, Core Sick Canna. Mmm, chili. This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. About an hour south of Big D, Dallas, you'll find Corsicana, Texas, in the prairies and lakes region of the Lone Star State. So for over a decade, I've been asking myself, Chet, can you make a full episode about Corsicana? And the obvious answer was always, Corsicana. <laughs> Sorry. But this town is full of some surprising things to do. And surprisingly, it also has one of the largest historic downtowns we've ever seen. Ooh, what's this? Bird seat? You mind if I take a bite? <laughs> Most towns are lucky to have one main street. Corsicana has 25 blocks of historic buildings, many corners marked with bronze statues of its past residents. So just uh, waiting on the crosswalk then, huh? All right, did you already push the button? Okay, cool. Hand off! Oh! <coughs> Whoa, we got quite a grip there. Does it change regularly? It seems like it's taken a long time. How long have you been here? Excuse me, officer, all due respect, but no further questions. I am now assuming counsel for these new clients of mine. What has he asked you? Uh, wait, that's my license plate. Are you giving me a ticket? I was only there for a little while. All right, fine, look, I'm just gonna jaywalk. Don't tell anybody. Well, I, I promise I'm a law-abiding citizen. I just haven't had my morning coffee yet. And the best thing happening downtown are all the new businesses filling old buildings, including the local Timbers Coffee. But what is this Texas two-step? I'm a sucker for like a house specialty, so what is that? Yes, that's our new signature drink, and it is a coconut, butter pecan, and vanilla, because it just makes you want a two-step. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can feel my feet moving already. Now what goes great with coffee? Cake, of course, Sicana, and in this town, specifically fruit cake. Just a few blocks away, you'll find Collins Street Bakery, the largest, most historic fruit cake company in the U.S. of A. You know, I cannot pass through Corsicana without stopping at Collins Street Bakery because, well, look at that cookie case. Oh man! Plus, uh, kids get a free cookie when they bring a parent in, and uh, I got a few kids. But of all the baked goods that they make, this one right here is the king. A Texas legend somewhere along the lines of, say, Willie Nelson or the Alamo. The Collins Street Bakery Deluxe Fruitcake. 125 years. That's how long they've been making their Deluxe Fruitcake. And they have a ravenous fan base, which is more than just our collective great ants. And eager to see how they keep up, I'm stepping into the back with co-owner Hayden Crawford. Whoa! How about this? This is huge! It's about 100,000 square feet here. We've got another 50,000 over there. We store our fruit cakes after we bake them. We can do about 20,000 cakes hand decorated a day here. Unbelievable! I know fruit cake has a bad reputation as being a weird loaf full of jelly beans with the consistency of a wet brick. But trust me, not all fruit cake is created equal. We start with the dry ingredients. 70 pounds of pecans, which makes up about 27% of the cake. They go in first. Yeah. Over a quarter of the cake is pecans? Almost a third of the cake is pecans. Unbelievable. Okay, this is our glossade fruit, and this is our pineapple. That looks like a sugar rush right there. <laughs> we'll put in papaya, Whoa. raisins, cherries. Most of the fruit actually comes from their own organic farm in Costa Rica. Add some honey and eggs, and let the mixing begin. 
This doesn't exactly look like my home mixer. This one's probably 70, 80 years old. You see how it's reaching in just like hands would? Yeah. It's actually folding the dough or the batter instead of blending and whipping it. All right, now who gets to lick the mixers? Ah, uh, yeah, well I do. Okay, all right, yeah. that's one of the <laughs> one of the perks of the job, yeah. you know? It's good to be the boss. This is a labor-intensive process, this is, huh? Now, during season, it's a whole different animal. We are very super efficient, but during the off-season, it is... Sure. Here, here we are. These days, Collins Street makes one million fruitcakes a year. And during fruitcake season, roughly Thanksgiving to Christmas, they'll do 90% of that in a couple months. And each cake is still hand-decorated with more pecans and glossade fruit, which, despite its vibrant color, is not a gummy snack, but real fruit. I think I'll just take this one right here. Oh, Chad. Hand me a spoon. Give me a spoon. <laughs> it's not even cooked yet. All right, I'll send you into the oven. Goodbye, dear friend. And after the cake bakes in these Texas-sized ovens, it's time for the delicious part. Oh, gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. I need a glass of milk. <laughs> You're not lying. How did fruitcake get a bad rap? Because it's delicious. Oh, well, thank you. And it's hard to explain. There's a lot of bad fruitcakes. I mean, ours is the best you can get. So it was, people just weren't eating the right fruit. Cakes. They weren't eating our fruit cake. <laughs> yeah. How's the new generation coming around to fruit cake? This is the most exciting part for us. This newer generation has never been exposed to the old bad press. They've okay. never heard it. So they see this thing as something new and hip and it's got a vintage. -y. It's vintagey. Yeah, it's fascinating how they've taken to this product that they have. Yeah. That's good. So you got another 125 years ahead of you. There you go. Easily. <laughs> Easily. 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 It's like a tasty piece of Texas history. And that, my amigos, is something to share. As they say, life is short, eat dessert first. Ah, but that still means you gotta eat lunch after. So let's head across the street, figuratively at least, to a diner that much like Collins Street Bakery has been serving Corsa Cannons for over a hundred years. As you can tell, this was the city's old soda fountain known as Hashup's Drugstore. And while they still serve some classic dishes, chef and owner Andres Kotsifos is adding his own spin. That hummus is amazing. I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> okay, so I don't quite recognize the accent. Is that East Corsicana? <laughs> or is that Northeast Corsicana? That's from? South Greece. It's South. <laughs> Andreas grew up on the island of Crete and then went on to work in France, Italy, Spain, and now Corsicana. How did you end up across well, the street? It's a long story. I learned to go along because everything that happens, happens for a reason. So sure. it was right the time that this town started to revitalize and a bistro and diner here became a huge uh, destination point. Historic downtowns need a catalyst to get people excited again, Exactly. right? Andreas is an incredible, forward-thinking chef, even owning a nicer steakhouse next door. Ah, but he still appreciates the history that comes with this little corner building, like being the first place Wolf Brand Chili was ever sold by a 12-year-old boy and his dog. So do y'all sell Wolf Brand Chili? Yes, we do. Okay. We sell a lot of it. Do you really? Yes. <laughs> Does that pain you as a, you know, a trained chef to be selling chili out of a can? Well, not really, but you know, that's different because yeah. that's, that has to do with history, but and so it doesn't bother me. Okay. I have a few items that I follow the original recipe that the Hassab's family was very nice to give me, uh -huh. like the Hassab's beef, the Hassab's grilled cheese, the potato salad, okay. and I make them myself. I okay. don't let anybody else touch it because it has to be, it has to be you know, dead yeah. on. A chef's precision even with historic recipes. And a Hashup's beef sandwich and some potato salad sounds great, but of course, as an appetizer. Say friend, when's the last time you had yourself a big steaming bowl of Wolf Brand chili? Well, that's too long. It's a steaming bowl of Texas. What do I need to say? It's Wolf Brand chili. It's delicious. Dive into this thing. I'm a big fan of like historic recipes, so I'm super excited to try this one. That's good. It hits all the spots. Toasted white bread, beef, mayo. It's the kind of thing I like to imagine my grandpa 
coming downtown to go to the you know the feed store and then walking in here to get himself a beef sandwich. Like a throwback, but still delicious. Potato salad. Ooh, that's good. Those are pimentos. So they add a little bit of pepperiness to it. 100 year old recipe on the sandwich, potato salad, and the chili. This is what Texas tradition tastes like. And it tastes good. Really good. We now interrupt this programming to remind you to like and subscribe. Now back to the road. Corsicana, Texas, first impressions. I actually, I didn't know they had such a big downtown area because I usually just pass through here. You see something that big and it makes you wonder, what was the city like a long time ago to be able to accommodate something that large? That's a good point. You're like, where were all these people? Yeah. Where did they live? What were they coming to do? Yeah. It could definitely hold a large population. Sure. They're just not there. So I feel good. I think Corsicana's gonna grow pretty quickly. Corsicana. Yeah, can it grow? Of course it can. Course it yeah, can. of course it can. Uh... See, I'm catching on. <laughs> Next up, we're going to step away from downtown and visit something that's recently brought worldwide attention to this little town and even more to this little Nevera College, home of the winningest cheerleading program in the world. All right, so if you've been paying attention, then you've at least heard about the Netflix documentary called Cheer that got produced about the cheer program here at Nevera College. And I'm super pumped because I'm about to meet Monica and I think a couple members of the team. Hey, hey, how are y'all? Hey! Hey, I'm Chet. Hi, I'm Monica, nice to meet so you. So good to meet y'all. Oh my gosh, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> huge fan, thank yes, you. Yes, we're so excited to have you here for your tryout. Huh? Huh? Uh, yeah. tryout. Yeah, I thought you would be a yeah, part um, of the team. You know, I eat barbecue for a living, uh, <laughs> so I don't exactly know. Well, you are the best coach in the world, right? <laughs> so if, if you can teach anybody, I yeah. hope you can teach me. We can, we can. All right. <laughs> when I say best in the world, I mean it. Under Monica's coaching, this team has claimed 14 national championships and competes against the largest universities in the country. But I better start with the basics. The team members Will, Athena, and Corey are showing me. <laughs> yeah. Super basic. Yes, super basic. <laughs> yes, this is like what? a beginning skill. We've, we've got you. What? Stretch it out. Stretch it out. You know, there are moments in my life when I wonder, what am I One, doing? Two. Catch your oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, okay, okay. We're gonna drop her. I'm gonna catch her weight. Uh, go go, 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 go drop her. Pop, okay. Pop and catch her weight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I was watching her feet just hang. It was like, wow, she's high. Yeah. I'm so underqualified for this. Okay, good, good. Two. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what? Oh, uh, thank you. You're being gracious. I made the team. Did I make the mat? Well, you haven't made mat yet, but you're close. I made, you I made this mat. I made this mat. I made mat at Nevera College. Making mat is a term used when you officially make the competitive team. I, I'm not there yet. I, I can barely breathe. So y'all, y'all do this kind of stuff like all day, every yeah. day, four, five, eight hours sometimes, just throwing people around. Twice a day. Gosh, do you want to punch people in the face when they say y'all aren't athletes? <laughs> I mean, yeah. yes. We're winning national championships. It's, it's hard. Oh, so. yeah. I've done mostly every sport, and this is the most challenging, like, full body sport I've ever done. It's a hard stereotype to break, but so that's why I was open to them coming and filming our lives and just, you know, showing what we do every single day. And they are truly incredible athletes. No, hey, thank y'all so much. I really do have a mad respect for all that y'all do and thank feel you. incredibly proud to know that Texas lays claim to such an amazing program. Thank so y'all are unbelievable. Oh, I'm not I'm really not worthy to stand on the same mat <laughs> as y'all. So. Go to any Nevera College sporting event and you can watch the cheer team do its thing. You might also meet Beauregard, the Bulldog mascot. Ah, but I think he smells the Longhorn on me. But school spirit isn't the only reason to visit Nevera College, because on campus you'll find the Pierce Collection Museum with one of the most impressive collections of Civil War memorabilia in the state. And this is museum docent Bob O'Toole. Wow. We've got about 17,000 original documents 
from the war here, along with some artifacts. From letters written on the battlefront to displays on wartime medicine, ouch, and of course, weaponry. This musket right here, it shows you that it was in the Civil War because right down here by the trigger is a mini ball. It's been lodged in there since the 1860s. In the, since the 1860s. That's pretty cool. And also take into consideration where that was up when he headed up here, if it had hit there. Oh, no kidding? Course, it might have been laying on the ground, but we don't know. <laughs> Make a lot of fun out of it yeah, anyway. Yeah, I like the more dramatic yeah. version. Yeah. He had it up to That's his right. eye yeah. and the bullet came in. There's always an air of mystery surrounding every historic artifact, but perhaps none more than these three rock heads in the museum's hunter-gatherer exhibit. Let me introduce you to the Malakoff Man. This one here was found in 1929, 20 feet below the surface. Okay. We know that it's uh, something that was brought in here from outside the area because of the type of rock it is. Based on the depth they were found and surrounding rock, some believe these heads could be as ancient as 50,000 years old. But based on our timelines, humans didn't make it to Texas until 15,000 years ago. Now we know that in that same pit, they found skeletons of mastodons, ancient camels, okay. and other animals that were extinct a long time ago. So. Oh, see, I like a good mystery right here. Yeah. This is one of those. We don't yet have the universe figured out, do no. we? So whether you believe these heads are 4,000 years old or just plain fake, they still bring up the point that we're not quite sure when us humans came to Texas. But if you ask the Malakoff man, it was long ago. Honest question. Malakoff man. Do we uh, just write it off as kind of fake or an anomaly, or do we burn our textbooks and go all in on Malakoff man? I was a little disappointed. I heard Malakoff man. I was like, there's a man, uh, I don't know, remains of a man, but it was just a rock. It was just a rock. It was actually three rocks. Just a rock. Just a rock? It's a rock that questions all of our entire belief systems of time. I mean, if Malakoff Man is real, then we can't believe anything. Okay, wait a second. Who is Malakoff Man? Malakoff Man is the name of those heads. They're wait, called, all three? All three are the Malak. Okay, they're called heads. They're called the Malakoff Suddenly heads. Suddenly, they've become the Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? The Malakoff Listen, Men. We are all looking for the truth. Maybe the truth is in the Trinity of the Malakoff heads. Okay, this just crossed over into some weird rock religion. <laughs> I want no part of this. The rocks yeah. speak the truth. <laughs> Maybe we need to get out of our heads for a bit. Back to the basic joys of life, like lakes, boats, and fishing. And lucky for us, Lake Richland Chambers is just down the road. And we're meeting up with local guide Ross Ramey to show us around one of the best fishing lakes in the state. Ready to go catch some fish? Let's do it. All right. You did say catch fish, so I'm uh, catch. trusting that you know what you're doing. You're going catching, not fishing. Okay, there we go. Of course, there are lakes all over Texas, but the reason I'm here is hybrid striper bass. Richland Chambers is one of Texas's best lakes for them, and Ross proclaims to know the sweet spots. Okay, I'm a little perplexed. We just stopped in the middle of the lake. <laughs> like, I mean, why? Why did you pick this place? You wouldn't think much would be here. No. So this is an underwater hump that usually holds a lot of fish. So. Okay. And Ross has some fresh shad to bait them in. I'm gonna get in the water as soon as you can. Just let it free spool to the bottom. Come up. We're gonna come up three cranks. Only thing I've done like this is catfishing. Right. It's, it's similar. Similar to the catfishing. One, two, three. They just fight a lot harder. Okay. Something just nibbled on it. Well, right there. Just keep it really still. Let the shad do the work. Y'all had so much doubt. If I catch a fish on the very first cast. Oh, don't talk like that right now. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That's what's, what's the most unlucky thing to say while you're fishing? <laughs> but it doesn't take long before fish are on. There you go. There you go. Oh, take time. Woo! Oh, oh! That's what Seriously? we're looking for. That's what we're looking that's for. That's a big fish. <laughs> Is that an average size hybrid striper? That's, that's an average size there. They get bigger. And once it starts, it don't stop. Whoa! That guy, whoa! Now I see why you like chasing these guys. Hybrid stripers must be 18 inches to keep, and you can only catch five a day. 
Now, usually I would never think about limits, but today? I've always heard about these fishermen say, oh, we had a day, we had a day. <laughs> I've never experienced one of those days. I think we may be having one of those days. Get you a bigger bait on, sometimes bigger bait, bigger fish. I like the thought of that. You know, That's I'm, like the kind of fish size that we're used to catch. catching. Catching, I know, I've <laughs> caught fish this big. Wait. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Goodness! Come on. All I right, guess I'm a believer now. Bait. I know. Daniel, don't ever doubt. <laughs> we can actually catch fish on the day trimmer. Oh! Holy moly! Oh yeah. Take down. There we go. This is awesome. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and that's it. I think it took you all of maybe 15 minutes today? Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> Catching's always better than fishing. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why I've been doing it wrong. I've been fishing, not catching. Hey, that's awesome. Thank you, Ron. I enjoyed it. Pleasure, Pleasure man. having you out today. Oh, man, thank you so much. This is not always that easy, but we, <laughs> today get, lucky. It was. we, we get lucky every once in a while. <laughs> That's some fast and furious fun. Now, I am taking these fish home to eat, but they'll have to wait because tonight I want to travel far from Corsicana, culinarily speaking, all the way to India to find some food that's good for the belly. This small kitchen was started by brothers Lovedeep and Tajinder, and Corsicana was even more ready for it than I am. How did this come about? Yeah, we tried something new over here. Uh huh. Yeah, there's no Indian restaurant in Navarro County. <laughs> so y'all are the lone man standing. How's it going? Have people been receptive to it? Yes. Yeah. And they, they've been like, thank you, you guys opened this restaurant over here. <laughs> These brothers learned how to cook at Indian restaurants on the West Coast and knew Corsicana was ready but they also knew they didn't want to combine it with their other family business next door. Uh, we were first thinking about like start the restaurant in a uh, gas station, but then we thought like we don't get much respect towards the food, so we, sure. we built up this separate place to open it up. Right, this is really making everything from scratch. Yes, the everything right is made way. from scratch, though the chicken is marinated, everything is, is made from scratch. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He's like an alchemist back here. He's got all these little chemistry powders. He keeps sprinkling them on. And I can almost just feel myself sweating. He keeps going back to that chili powder. Indian cooking is all about spice. And much of it revolves around a tandoor clay oven. What? It's like some fiery inferno. Oh, it's where they cook meat and classic Indian naan bread. Yeah, then we stick it to the side of it. What? It just sticks to the side of the oven like that? Yes, sir. <laughs> I never knew that's how they cook naan bread. It's like white bread. I had a baby with a warm tortilla. I'm like, oh, good. They have adapted their menu to make it more familiar locally, like tikka masala pizza, which looks delicious. But I'm eager to try their take on the classics. All right. So I just asked him, what you cooking in the back? And evidently he said, I'm gonna cook you everything. We got chicken tikka masala, classic Indian dish. We got palak paneer, which is a cheese spinach dish. We have lamb korma, and here another vegetarian dish called dal makhni. I mean, it's not so unfamiliar, right? I mean, that looks like a good plate at a church buffet. And you just take everything and you sop it up with a biscuit. Non bread, essentially, Indian biscuit. Oh, it's so good. Ooh. Hey there, little lamb. I see what you're doing. When you asked them I wanted mild, medium, or hot, frankly, I was terrified of what they would do at hot, so I went medium. And so it's got a good flavor punch. Like everything just kind of burns just a little bit. I don't know why I came around to Indian food so late in life. We've probably fallen into the rut too many times. You're in a small town, what do you eat? Barbecue, Tex-Mex. You gotta break out of that sometimes. You gotta like think a little bigger. Across the Pacific Ocean bigger. Big cities, small towns, a thousand stoplights or just one. Every town has reasons for tripping. Untold stories, unexplored alleyways, folks making history. And can you find amazing things in towns of all sizes? Well, the answer is, and has always been, of course you can. Oh, now that food feels mighty good in my belly. And for dessert, a little gulab jamun. So I'll see all y'all out on the road. Bye con Dios, amigos. I mean, it's deep fried and soaked in syrup. How could that not be delicious? Mm -mm -mm. 
Howdy, y'all. Follow along with my adventures at Chet Tripper on Instagram and at the Day Tripper TV on Facebook and YouTube. Or head to thedaytripper.com for travel guides, past episodes, and info on our mobile app and Team Day Tripper. This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Howdy, y'all. Chet the Day Tripper here. Thanks so much for tripping with us. Uh, remember, while you're here, like this video, subscribe to our channel so that we can stay out there on the road and keep on tripping. <laughs> Did we miss anything in this town? Leave us a comment, let us know. We love finding out about new stops with all your tips. And if you love Epic Texas Day Trips, remember to check our channel. We got a lot of them on there. Also, don't forget, if you want some sweet Day Tripper merch or another cool Texas made product, Come see us in Georgetown at the Day Tripper World Headquarters. You can also shop online if you check the link down there in the caption. All right, y'all. Bye, Condias, amigas.